In trying to ungarble a past which has made such a hideous present, where do you start? Well, you could do worse than start here at Westminster in London, the seat of British government. Because for over 800 years, government here in London has made a claim to concern itself with Ireland. And you could, quite reasonably, oversimplify things and say that that is the cause of the Irish problem. And certainly, it's the cause of Britain's Irish problem because the attempt to assert that claim has given Britain one of the most persistent problems of her long domestic history. For instance, this is what the first Queen Elizabeth had to say. We receive naught else but news of fresh losses and calamities from Ireland. We disdain to bear affronts from a rabble of base kern. And William Pitt, the younger. I say that Ireland is subject to great and deplorable evils, which have a deep root, for they lie in the situation of the country itself. Sir Robert Peel. Her Majesty's government has found that in four or five counties in Ireland, not only that the free liberty of action is controlled by a grievous tyranny, but they found that law has been paralyzed, that repeated murders are committed, and that no trace can be discovered of the murderers. And William Gladstone. We say that the Irish question is the curse of this house. It is the great and standing impediment to the effective performance of its duties. You have not got in Ireland a state of contentment. In Gladstone's time, this school in Clerkenwell, London, was a Victorian prison. In it, an arrested leader of the Fenians, who aimed to make Ireland a Republican nation separate from Britain. His comrades outside had planned his escape. They succeeded in blowing an enormous hole in the wall of the prison exercise yard. The warders had prevented his escape, but the explosion destroyed or damaged many houses in the Clerkenwell neighborhood. It caused more casualties even than the Birmingham bombings of 1974. 21 dead after Birmingham, but 30 after Clerkenwell and many mutilated. An Irishman named Michael Barrett was eventually hanged for the Clerkenwell explosion of 1867, providing incidentally the spectacle of the last public execution in Britain. An eyewitness said he didn't seem to suffer much. We'll be hearing about the execution of all too many Irishmen in this series, more than a hundred in my own lifetime. But Michael Barrett was in a way special because the explosion he caused helps bring about a far greater change even than its devastating effect on Clerkenwell. Because here at Westminster, the Prime Minister, Gladstone, now seriously began to concern himself with Irish grievances, to reform the land system of Ireland, and finally, to concern himself with Ireland's claim to be a nation. It was the Fenian conspiracy and the Clerkenwell explosion that first induced the British people to embrace in a manner foreign to their habits in other times the vast importance of the Irish controversy. As a result of many British government reforms, by 1900, when Queen Victoria visited Dublin, Ireland seemed more contented than at any other time in her history. there was hardly an Irish Republican voice to be heard. Similar loyalty to the British Crown was seen in Dublin three years later when the next British monarch visited the city, Edward VII. It did seem as if the bad times in the relations between the two islands had gone forever. Then, at Easter 1916, out of the blue, bewildering Britain and Ireland alike, came amazing news of an Irish Republican rebellion. 
A week later, the centre of Dublin was in ruins. What was eventually clear was that the peace between the two islands had been shattered. Four years later, in 1920, Ireland was seething with unrest on a scale unknown for over a hundred years. The ordinary Irish population, often until recently without very strong political feeling, found themselves face to face with British bayonets. Murder walked the streets on both sides, black and tans, he said there were no good Irishmen and all the rest of it, and uh, you kill them all. And IRA. We went down to Chaplin, or left in the names' room. I put the tube up against the wall. I said, the Lord of mercy on your souls. I plugged the two of them. That killing was ordered by a man, Michael Collins, who'd masterminded the whole Irish Republican campaign. Next year, 1921, he was invited to Downing Street, London, by Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, to negotiate about Irish freedom from British rule and help win for Ireland greater independence than she'd had for centuries. So, you can see how some people could well think Irish history dangerous. The Clerkenwell explosion helped change British government policy towards Ireland here in Downing Street. The violence of the old IRA between 1920 and 1921 changed British government policy. And the IRA of today are hoping that by their violence, they'll change British government policy. Looking into the past could well be said to be causing encouragement to them. But of course, the past is already encouragement to them. What we have to do is see how it came to be so and whether it need go on being so. Malin Head in County Donegal, the most northerly point in Ireland, though officially in Southern Ireland. If you take a bird's flight out to sea there, going past the Giant's Causeway, which is officially in Northern Ireland, and past Rathlin Island to Fair Head, on a clear day you can see only some 13 miles away the coast of Britain and the very first inhabitants of Ireland arrived here across that channel perhaps some 8,000 years ago. Note incidentally what geography does to history. How the physical closeness of Britain ensured that its attentions would be inevitable. In the centre of Ireland, it's easier to forget that all-embracing figure of the neighbour island. There may have been over 800 years of attention from London, but there was something like 8,000 years of human life in Ireland before that. the valley of the river Boyne, to which came around 3000 BC, the first settlers in Ireland of whom we have any substantial traces, very substantial traces.
This is the inside of one of those great mounds. They're eerie but magnificent underground burial chambers. And this one at Newgrange in County Meath is the finest passage grave in Western Europe. This is the passage that I've just come up. And this here is the central burial chamber. Buried here some 5,000 years ago were the tribal kings of an organized Irish agricultural society. Those uh, earlier Stone Age people coming across the North Channel from Scotland, you can hardly describe as a society. But this lot, coming probably straight up the Irish Sea from the Iberian Peninsula via Brittany, you certainly can. Though theirs was a simple agricultural society, it also had some sophistication. Just look in here at these decorated carvings, all done, of course, without the help of any iron tools. The earliest personal signatures, you could say, of an Irish identity. And outside, on the stones that surround this vast burial mound at ground level, are further examples of this early Irish people's art. So, at least you start with something quite separate from Britain. There's nothing as sophisticated as this in Stone Age Britain. You start with this, as it were, great symbol of Irish individuality and separateness. <laughs> Many invaders were to come and put their own imprint on that specialness. But the invaders who were to leave the strongest individual mark, coming to Ireland some 2,000 years later, were the Gales. The hill of Tara in central Ireland, where lived the pagan Gaelic High Kings. High kings who claimed to be rulers of all Ireland, but who spent much of their time defending what was really a semi-sacred symbolic title against many other kings of the warring tribal groups which made up this early agricultural society. But, and it's an important but, above their tribal groupings and their wars, these people shared a common language a common code of law, the Brehan law, a common tradition of poetry and music, and a common history adopted from ancient legend. At a time when no country was a nation in a modern centralized sense, when British society was being at least partly shaped by the Romans, no Roman administrator ever set foot in Ireland, and Ireland had its own cultural identity, which you could call a sort of nationhood. Many shocks were in store for this nationhood. The first, when the Romano-British figure, St. Patrick, drove paganism from the hill of Tara and made Ireland Christian. And specially Christian, Ireland was always to be. The conversion was a triumph, not just for Christianity, but for a fusion of Christianity with the Gaelic Irish world. Through history since, there's always been this special relationship between Irish identity and the Christian church. Monasteries like this one at Clonmacnoise, rather than Roman bishoprics, became the special feature of the Irish church. And these Irish monasteries provided the framework for a Christian Gaelic golden age. Monasteries like this shone from Gaelic Ireland like a beacon in Europe through the dark ages after the fall of Rome to the barbarians. In monasteries like this, the details of an already ancient Irish society first get written down.
magnificent works of art are fashioned. The Book of Durrow, a 7th century transcription of the Gospels. The Ardar Chalice of the early 8th century. The Book of Kells, the Gospels again, a masterpiece of that 8th century's end. But for this Gaelic world, the world of Gaelic Christianity itself, a great shock from the outside was now in store. The Vikings, or Norsemen, were on their way to Ireland. Into this world, one day in the year 795 AD, the first of thousands of long, beautifully curving, high, proud, open boats filled with fierce and terrible, strange, helmeted warriors from beyond the sea, armed with heavy swords and spears, came driving onto the shores of Lambay Island here, off the Dublin coast. It was the beginning of the Vikings, or Norsemen's, invasions of Ireland. Danes, they're sometimes known as in Irish popular history, but they came mainly from Norway. And they came now, slaughtering and burning and ransacking their way into Irish history, terrorizing and looting Gaelic homesteads and monasteries alike. Over and over and over again they came. More than a century later, an Irish chronicler is still writing of immense floods and countless sea vomitings of ships and boats and fleets, so that there wasn't a land port or a harbor or a fastness in all Munster without floods of Danes and pirates. To the most secret places of Gaelic Christianity in the very heart of Ireland came the Vikings or Norsemen with their dreadful slaughter, pillage and rape. How would Gaelic nationhood cope? For although there was a high king, Gaelic Ireland was still a nation of warring tribal alliances. This is the site of the great Irish monastery at Glendalough. There was no organized national resistance to the Norsemen. In 1014, a king from County Clare named Brian Boru, who'd uh, managed to fight his way against other Irishmen up to the High Kingship of Ireland, defeated at Clontarf a great army consisting partly of the Norsemen of Dublin. But the other part of that army he defeated consisted of the Irishmen of Leinster, while uh, other great kings of Ireland stood apart on the sidelines to see what pickings were going when the battle was over. Round towers like this one were built all over Ireland as combined belfries and refuges for the monasteries which the Norsemen were constantly sacking. You can see from this one at Glendalough the sort of thing that must have happened. The entrance was set high above the level of the ground and at the first sound of the alarm from the top of the belfry you mounted rapidly, presumably pulling the ladder up after you. What appalling scenes of brutality and terror must once have been enacted here, not once, but many times in these quiet, gentle places. And yet the Norsemen, the Vikings, became in time part of Ireland, building on the coasts the first Irish towns, settling into the Gaelic pattern of warring kings, above all intermarrying with the Gaelic Irish and becoming Irish themselves. And as the new Irish, they were to experience the next great shock to come.
At the creek of Baginban, Ireland was lost and won. Thus runs an ancient Irish jingle. This is the beach at Baginban, where a small party of Normans who had sailed across the sea from Wales landed on the 1st of May, 1170, and made their way up onto this promontory here. Here, they built up this vast rampart, a ditch and double bank, that's still very impressive after eight centuries of Irish wind and weather. With this rampart, they were able to cut off the neck of the promontory and use it as a bridgehead. Norseman Irish from the town of Waterford, allied with local Gaelic Irish, came to try and dislodge them. But they failed, and the Normans eventually fanned out across Ireland from this bridgehead. What a bridgehead into Irish history. Eight centuries of conflict were to flow from it. A conflict that is even now not over. These Normans had been sent not by the King of England, but by one of his barons, the Earl of Pembroke, known as Strongbow. And Strongbow had sent them because he'd been invited to do so by an Irish king, Dermot McMurrah, the King of Leinster, who wanted his help in a quarrel he was having with the High King of Ireland. Strongbow obviously hoped for something in return. But what McMurrah, said to have a voice hoarse from shouting in the din of battle, particularly wanted, was the Norman military technology. Knights in armour and archers. The Irish, fighting without armour, were only using stones and slings at the time. The Norman Baron Strongbow himself arrived from across the sea soon afterwards with more knights in armour and more archers. And within a year, he'd not only captured Dublin for McMurrah, uh, but had married McMurrah's daughter, and when McMurrah died, had become King of Leinster himself. And it was then that the King of England, Henry II, intervened. Not to subdue the Irish particularly, but to subdue Strongbow, who was clearly getting ideas above his station for one of the King's feudal subjects. And that is the beginning of London's claim to concern itself with Ireland. The problem of subduing the Irish was taken on almost without realising it. The effect on the Gaelic world of the Norman adventurers who stormed into Ireland in the wake of Strongbow was devastating. Allying themselves with some Irish chieftains, they built great bastions to protect the land and cattle they seized from others. The Irish had never seen anything like this before. With their heraldic pomp and their superior military technology, the Normans penetrated into all parts of Ireland except western and central Ulster. Although they owed nominal allegiance to their overlord, the English king, they were in pursuit only of their own interests, land and wealth, and they spread their castles across the country in that pursuit. Remote from their nominal allegiance to the English king, they gradually lost touch with English law and government and became part of the traditional Gaelic pattern of warring tribal anarchy. Part of the landscape, you might say. Intermarrying with the Irish, often exchanging their own Norman French for Irish, they became, as the saying went, more Irish than the Irish. Strand racing near Dundalk today. Take any ordinary collection of people like this in Ireland today. What does it mean to say they're Irish? 
Irish blood is a mixture of the blood of all the many different races of invaders who've ever come to Ireland over thousands of years. The blood of the Stone Age men who built New Grange. The blood of those Gales who first came as invaders themselves. The blood of those Gales mixed with the blood of earlier and later invaders. The blood of the Gales mixed with that of the Vikings and the Normans and the English to make today's Irish people. A mixture which Ireland has made Irish. Take the shop fronts. A name with fits in it shows Norman descent. Many names that today seem most typically Irish are Norman. Burke de Borgo. O'Leary, pure Gaelic, but Joyce is Norman de Jorts. As these Normans and the early English settlers who followed them to Ireland lost touch with their origins, government often tried to stop them adopting Irish hairstyles, Irish manners, Irish language and laws. To no avail. The degenerate English, they were called. The King's government in Dublin shrank within a defensive frontier of a few hundred square miles known as the Pale. Sometimes the Pale itself had to shrink even closer to Dublin. Beyond the pale is a phrase we still use about people whose behaviour we can't control or cope with. This is the pale today, originally probably some sort of palisade, but later this defensive double ditch built by the English government in Ireland to mark and enclose the relatively small area around Dublin which it could control and to divide it from the people on the other side it couldn't cope with. Uh, such people being, of course, not just the wild Gaelic Irish, but also the Gaelicized English, more Irish than the Irish. The area enclosed by the Pale varied from time to time. This bit, built at the end of the 15th century, is only some 20 miles from Dublin. West of here, the Crown of England's writ simply did not run. an end to all this was at hand. The Tudors were now on the throne of England. Hampton Court, Middlesex, England. Elegant and stately palace of the two great Tudor monarchs, Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth symbol of that sophistication and control which such monarchs were to bring to English government in new times. And this sophistication and control was now to be extended to Ireland as well as to the rest of their lands. We know exactly what Ireland was like soon after Henry VIII came to the throne because the state papers of the day tell us more than 60 counties inhabited by the king's Irish enemies, of which some call themselves kings, some dukes, 
some archdukes living only by the sword and obeying no other temporal person, making peace or war for themselves. Also more than 30 captains of the English folk that follow the same Irish order. And every one of them maketh war or peace for himself without license of the king. And not only that, because the king's own deputy in Ireland, of the great Norman House of Fitzgerald, was soon to be out in rebellion against him. To all this, the Tudors, but in particular Queen Elizabeth I, was eventually to put an end. And a very bloody end too. Two sets of people in Ireland now experienced the new order of modern Tudor rule. The old English of ancient Norman settler stock, who, for all their Elizabethan finery, adhered to Gaelic customs, such as that of walking about bare-legged. And the bare-legged Gaelic chiefs, too, who, for all their Gaelic ways, had adopted much of the style and finery of the Elizabethans. For both types of chieftain, but particularly the Gaelic, Elizabeth's new order was to be a harsh and terrible experience, shaking them out of what was later seen as an idyll of independence forever. Though the lifestyle of a Gaelic chieftain was often similar to that of other Elizabethans, English observers liked to interpret the differences as detrimental to the Irish. They liked to think of the Irish as uncivilized. The Irish live like beasts, are more uncivil, more uncleanly, more barbarous in their customs and demeanors than in any part of the world that is known. Certainly outside their homes, the behavior of the Gaelic chieftains was rough. They spoil and burn and bear away as fit occasions serve, and think the greater ill they do, the greater praise deserve. They pause not for the poor man's cry, nor yet respect his tears, but rather joy to see the fire, to flash about his ears. And thus, bereaving him of house, of cattle, and of store, they do return back to the wood from whence they came before. Cattle raids had been part of the Gaelic way of life for well over a thousand years. Bringing the Gaelic way of life within the new order, the English officials and Queen Elizabeth herself felt morally reinforced by a sense of civilizing mission. When occasion doth present, you should rather allure that rude and barbarous nation to civility by discreet handling rather than by force and shedding of blood. Yet when necessity requireth, you are ready also to oppose yourself and your forces to those whom reason cannot bridle. There was to be much shedding of blood both Gaelic and Old English. The Crown's deputies in Ireland were now Englishmen, newly appointed from England, and the new armies were to be mainly composed of English soldiers rather than of levies raised in Ireland. These new armies conducted the wars of Elizabeth in Ireland against Old English and Gaelic Irish alike with ruthless savagery. rebellions of the old English, with or without Gaelic allies, against this new order. A new order which the Gaelic Irish, too, resisted with equal recklessness alone when they chose to, meeting with the same terrible retribution. These new English armies of Elizabeth, though they used loyal Gaelic Irish as allies, in general saw Ireland and its natives as territory and a population to be conquered and civilized as the Spanish conquistadores saw the territory of the American Indians. A barbarous country, wrote one official, must first be broken by war before it will be capable of good government. This was the English consensus. And of course, in practical terms, it worked. By the end of Elizabeth's reign, Ireland was, for the first time ever, 
under something like the effective control of English government. But also, of course, there was another consensus, an Irish one. In this time of Elizabeth was laid that first foundation of traditional Irish hate for governing Englishmen, which was to remain so long and so deep in Irish consciousness. Also in this time of Elizabeth was laid the foundation of what is still to many people the most salient, continuous feature of Irish identity, its Catholicism. Like St. Patrick, I too have heard the voice of the Irish calling to me from the very beginning of its faith, Ireland has been linked with the apostolic see of Rome. I have come to you as bishop of Rome and pastor of the Holy Church in order to celebrate this union with you in the sacrifice of the Eucharist. The reformation of the church, which had made England Protestant and the English monarch supreme head of the church instead of the Pope, this reformation hadn't taken effect in Ireland. The simplest reason for this was a straightforward physical one, the same as that which aggravated all England's problems in Ireland. Communication by land with a population of about a million people, scattered across an island half covered with bog and scrub and with almost no roads at all, was extremely difficult. Even if English government hadn't had its work cut out trying to impose English law, let alone English doctrine, the Irish church, which showed no interest in the new Protestant ideas, was to a great extent still further inaccessible behind the major barrier of the Irish language. There was no Protestant prayer book in Irish. So the Gaelic Irish and the Old English thus together acquire a further badge of difference from the new English officials and settlers by remaining Catholic while the new men are Protestant. Among these Catholics the Gaelic tradition is still very distinct. Hurling, an ancient Gaelic game, much played in Ireland today. At the end of the 16th century, the last desperate move to save the independence of the Gaelic chieftains came from Ulster. An armed Ulster uprising, led by the great Hugh O'Neill, who'd been brought up in England and made Earl of Tyrone by Queen Elizabeth herself. O'Neill was half Elizabethan, but stronger in him was that feeling of dissent from those O'Neills inaugurated as the O'Neill in the great ancestral wood at Tullahog and once High Kings of Ireland. O'Neill struck to save his local independence in Ulster from the Queen's rule. In 1598, O'Neill won a great victory in Ulster over the Queen's forces at a battle known as the Yellow Ford. English government in Ireland was shaken, as someone wrote, until it tottered. Three years later, ships and soldiers from Catholic Spain, 
sailed to the southern Irish port of Kinsale to help O'Neill. The Queen's English deputy, Mountjoy, immediately marched to besiege Kinsale. O'Neill and his ally O'Donnell, evading other English forces, came south to besiege Mountjoy in his turn, and the last great battle for the independence of the chieftains of Gaelic Ireland was fought outside Kinsale in 1601. <laughs> Fighting in open country, away from the more favourable bogs and woods of their native Ulster, O'Neill and O'Donnell were totally defeated. And they finally submitted on their knees to the royal authority, as many a Gaelic chief had already done before them. Gaelic law, Gaelic authority, was now at the mercy of the new English rule. O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, was pardoned and freed to live as a man without authority in his own lands. After six years, this was too much for him. One day, from the shores of Loch Swilly in Ulster, he set sail with his ally, the Earl of Tyrconnell, on a foreign ship that had come to fetch them. And they said goodbye to Ireland for voluntary exile in Europe. The event is romanticized in Irish history as the flight of the earls. It was the end of one sort of Ireland. Ireland was now a province of England to be ruled for England through Dublin Castle. In the 19th century, when modern Irish nationalism first tried to express itself, there was a sort of unofficial national anthem written for Ireland. The official one, of course, was God Save the Queen. And this unofficial national anthem used to be sung for years at uh, Irish political meetings and Irish gatherings all over the country. And it went as follows. A nation once again, a nation once again, that Ireland, long a province, be a nation once again. But how realistic was it to say that the sort of nation Ireland had once been was relevant to the present? And anyway, what if a large minority of the Irish people, concentrated mainly in the north, didn't want Ireland to be a nation once again at all? Thank mm -hmm. you.